Here we are. Welcome back to another wonderful week of cannabis news, uh, of the absolute pleasure and privilege to just be on camera with the Argentinian action figure himself, <laughs> Javier. Jose, what's up, man? How are you doing today, Mr. Great. Elliot Lane? I'm doing great. You know, this is my last full week as a resident of New York City. Ooh. I am moving officially down to North Carolina next week, hence why I look like I'm in a prison or dungeon. I mean, I could shift my camera and you'd see bars on the window because I'm on the first floor of a New York City apartment and welcome to New York. But that being said, man, it's a busy time in my life, but I always love taking a break and chatting cannabis. Y'all, if you are here for the first time, drop a one in the chat. Uh, if you are here as a regular listener, or you've been here before, drop a two. We always love to know uh, who is listening. Uh, let's get through some news. We have two oh, killer yeah. guests today. Uh, so first and foremost, we are going to live interview with Dan Humiston. He is the head man, the CEO, the founding partner, or not partner, founder of um, PodCon X, uh, an awesome, awesome network uh, of podcasts. I can't wait to get his perspective on a, a number of items there. Uh, and then secondly, we have an interview that I did with Abner Curtin on Friday about his first quarter performance. Uh, as well as he touches on med, he touches on a lawsuit of sorts. So uh, a lot coming from that interview as well. But Javier, cool, throwing it to you, man. Take over. Tell us what's on your mind right now. Uh, there's an interesting study um, that was reported by Stanford Medicine. They looked at, at cannabis and how it affects risk of premature heart attacks. Uh, and they, they found that THC or, you know, the psychoactive component of cannabis does cause inflammation in the cells in the heart, uh, in the, uh, in, in the interior of the blood vessels and can lead to, um, higher risk for uh, heart attacks. What's mm -hmm. interesting too, is they discovered a small molecule called ganistine, I believe ganistine. Uh, which is found in soy and fava beans that could block this inflammation. So we might be seeing some kind of a mix in the future. I don't know. What do you think? Do you envision a, a near future where we see cannabis products infused with this molecule from soy? Here's, here's what I'd say. I would be absolutely shocked if the cannabis industry even acknowledged this study. <laughs> That's my personal opinion, man. If you want I my mean, actual, like, yeah. w whether it should be, that'd be cool. Will some people use this to, you know, to to infuse that and be like, this is actually a healthier alternative of marijuana uh, or, or of utilizing cannabis in one fashion or another? <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, but I just, I don't foresee this, it, even I mean, though this is, these are huge numbers. This study was huge. Half a million yep. people, 11,000 yep. of which smoke more than once a month, reported in this study. And these numbers have to be acknowledged. I just don't see them we acknowledging to, it. We, we need to. Uh, I know I will get quite a bit of hate on social media for sharing this uh, and even for covering it. But the, the fact remains that we can't ignore it, especially when it comes from a credible source, as Samford is. Um, you know, it's... It's interesting to start to really understand the good and the bad in, in cannabis, right? It, it, we can't be we can't be biased in that in that way and, and go like, okay, cannabis is all good, agreed, it's really Ag great, but yeah. we need to acknowledge the risks. Well, and that's how you develop a product that is consistent, is quality. That is a true CPG uh, uh, brand, in my opinion, is something that takes into consideration all of the pros and cons. Um, you know, of the plant itself, of the plant medicine, of the plant product, whatever you want to uh, utilize your business for. But that being said, you know, I mean, I haven't seen anybody, any of the major businesses acknowledge this yet. And this has been out for several days now. Um, so we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, unless this equates like lung cancer to cigarettes, which I just, it's not yet. You know, it, it'll be hard pressed, I think, to get a big MSO to acknowledge that. Anyway, I'm in agreement with you to clarify, and nobody's going to hate you on social media except for Mitch. Uh, <laughs> um, what else, Javi? What else is on your mind, man? Um, Oxley Cannabis, that is CBWTF on the OTC, released its financial results. Um, it is the company is feeling the impact of price competition in, in the vape market. 
However, Pablo Swanich, our good friend at Ken Fitzgerald, still believes the stock has potential, maintains an overrate rating on the stock um, and a price target of 20 Canadian cents. Can I ask uh, you a question about these earnings? Yeah. You know, one of the main points I've seen a lot in Oxley's releases, and honestly, most of the Canadian licensed producers, is their claim for some sort of top five market share or top 10 market share uh, in the country. And everybody has a different category. name that they have the top market share for. And Oxley's was top in cannabis 2.0 products. But then my mind goes to, whoa, 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 whoa. That's inclusive of gummies, right? And edibles. And wouldn't Indiva lead that? I, I'm very, like, honestly, for me, these market share claims in these earnings reports, yeah. I want your perspective because you've been looking at them a lot, a lot longer than I have. Uh, and it just, to me, it, what what should we as investors be looking at when we look I at market share? I honestly don't like those claims generally unless they can be easily proven. Uh, I don't like estimates either, to be honest, right? Like every estimate about the potential market size has a bunch of assumptions. Uh, I am not a big fan of these claims either, right? Because uh, e each company will go to their own data and choose the words carefully so that they are the first, the best, the biggest. To me, there's few measures that are under, like hard to dispute. One being market cap, revenue, you know, net profit. Number the, tax, the tax number is big right now too, especially in the U.S. But anyways, keep going. I mean, that, that is about it, right? Like that is th those are the only measures that I really see that that are, are worth something, right? In terms of market leadership. Um, mm -hmm. Then the rest, it's fine. You know, it's one of the top 10 is like, okay, what does that mean? Are you one of the top 10 with what, what percentage, what share, right, of the market? Mm -hmm. if the market is so fragmented and so many different companies have a, a, an, in, like an important piece of the, of the market. So we obviously have a ton of earnings reports. We cover them all on Benzinga.com slash cannabis. If you're interested, I think Green Lane reported. Planet 13 reported end of yesterday. We covered them. Uh, I think um, you had... Uh, Halo Canvas report today as well. But one last bit of something for me that I have a question for. What do you take from Akerna's start of, of this review process they're doing with JMP Securities? They Their CFO is leaving. Who I'm a big fan of John, to be honest. I love John. Uh, he's leaving to pursue other opportunities. Their president and COO is um, converting over to a special advisor to Jessica. Um, what is there anything that you think we should keep an eye out for when looking at KERN? I mean, honestly, let's I would keep a close eye on how they restructure. This could be a change for the better or for the worse, right? Like like every management change, uh, it can it can bring new life to to a company that in certain ways needs it. Um, so it's a matter of, of really keeping an eye out on or, or a, I, an eye on the new uh, assignments and their performance i would give them three to six months and it should be clear if they've had a positive impact or a negative impact uh, of course there are market dynamics there are external factors that that the company cannot control uh, at the same time i have to acknowledge that the fact that that there is such a big management shakeup with with two of the top leaders uh leaving or changing positions is somewhat concerning uh, look at mitch in the chat i honestly i agree I'm a big fan of Jessica. I think Jessica is an awesome, awesome CEO. And her doing this could be her um, looking at the market and looking how her stock has been not doing great for a while now. Um, and maybe this is her answer or the company's answer, but it, it's hard to look at this in, in a positive light. But we'll see. I think, like you said, we need to give it some time. Indeed, I have three rapid fire, rapid uh, fire. items and we can get to the interview. Uh, well, no, four, actually. One is go to benzinga.com slash cannabis to check out Sundial er, uh, Growers' earnings. You're always asking about Sundial S-N-D-L. In the chat, you have all the details. Benzinga.com slash cannabis. Big shout out to the entire team. Maureen, Nina, Elena, Natan, Nico, Fermin. You know, they do an amazing job. Vuk covering uh, all the, the, the cannabis news happening every day. There's all, all like about 40 articles every day on Benzinga.com slash cannabis. Having said this, three big news items. Again, go check out the details on Benzinga.com slash cannabis. One is a report that says eliminating cultivation taxes in California could double the state's cannabis revenue by 2024. Actually, 
increases by 123%. The taxes right now are so high that they could go as high as $90 per ounce. That is crazy. Another one, the FDA is warning about THC copycat edibles, uh, pointing that children could be in, like especially in danger. Copycat edibles, for those who don't know, are cannabis edibles that emulate as closely as possible uh, mainstream brands. So anything from Wonka, um, you know, uh, sweets to uh, cereal, they will, they will imitate it and, and some people get confused. Last but not least, Method Man out of the famous Wood and Clan launches brand Tikal in Michigan through a partnership with Glorious Cannabis Co. Awesome brand. Go check it out if you're in Michigan. Don't miss out on Method Man's uh, weed. It's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Great rapid fire, Javi. That was, that, was, that was actually some good headlines there. I'm with Money Mitch. Do we need to hand out samples? Let's go. Um, GTBIF, how about this? We'll come back to GTI as always after our next interview. Uh, shall we, Javi? Yes, sir. Let's get to it. I'm pumped for this. Please welcome founder and CEO of PodCon X, Dan Homiston. Let's bring him on over, Aaron. Welcome to it, Dan. How's it going, man? It's going great. Guys, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, thank you for joining us. This is the dad in a cannabis family. <laughs> Who was that. first? You, right? Yeah, like you were like uh, Carson can follow. I am the trailblazer here, right? Yeah. I, as a matter of fact, I um I started in I started looking into it in 2012. So she was still in high school at the or she might have been in college at the time. Um, wow. But yeah, I started I started in 2012. As a matter of fact, I remember when I told her we were the, she was studying abroad, and we and we um. We took a trip to, um, we were in Greece and I, it was one of those islands in Greece and we were walking along the street and I said, Hey, what do you think about this? And she, <laughs> he looked at me like, are you out of your mind? This is, you know, like I said, 2012, she didn't, she was like, well, what are you crazy? And, um, might have been here we are today. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's awesome, man. So well, tell what us. What were you doing before cannabis? Wait, I'm, I'm very Good curious as to, to why, why that response, because again, Carson at that time was like 22 years old. Like, no, no, no. She was, she was, she was, she was still in college. So she was probably so even younger. My yeah, point yeah. being, you know, you'd expect a college kid to go like, Oh, weed. Awesome. Go dad. You know? So what were you doing before that? That was so surprising to well, her to, to learn. It, I owned a a, a, a a chain of tanning salons. I started tanning in ni uh, 1985, and I had. Um, Do you know a lot about getting toasted? <laughs> yeah, I had all. The <laughs> getting, getting baked, getting baked. Yeah, oh, we we, um, we were the largest tanning at one point. We were the largest tanning salon chain in the country, uh, but the biggest one in New York State by far. And um, yeah, so she grew up in a in a tanning. So we were a little bit out there. I mean, as far as like. You know, it wasn't the most. There's a lot of skepticism and a lot of and a lot of cr people looked at us a little funny when we, you know, when it did tell them what we did. And um, so she was <laughs> so she was kind of used to that. And then but but I mean, we were still I was still in the business. So the idea of, of going into something else, starting something else was I think that's why she was looking at me like, what are you nuts? But, and was it PodCon X in 2012? Was that? No, uh, I started jump into it. I started the uh, Cannabis World Congress Business Expo. So that was, it was a trade show. And then I ended up, I sold that show and the CWCB Expo, I no longer involved with that. Um, and then I had some time, wasn't sure exactly what to do, but wanted to keep my hand in the business and uh, started a podcast. And that's how it started. Just it was as simple as a podcast. And then a couple of friends said, hey, can you help? We want to do a podcast. Can you help us? And before you knew it, I had half a dozen of them that I was helping. You know, the funny thing is, Back then, even now, it was like so hard to get advertisers because they'd say, you know, how many listeners do you have? And it'd be like, yeah, but they're super loyal. And they'd be like, yeah, but you don't have a million listeners. And I'm like, I know, but they're super loyal. They'll buy your stuff. One day I was just talking to them and they said, well, could you get us on everybody's show? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it was like, duh. <laughs> and that was really the genesis of it. I, I was like, sure, we can. And then before you know it, now we're up to, I think we're at 35 shows that we're you know, wow. producing or on our network. And we just, you know, we sell the entire network and advertisers are like, yeah, this is great. I don't have to deal with 35 individual podcasts. So just put, you know, we buy one ad and 
you plug Man. it, it plays across the network. That's fantastic. So um, is it all cannabis driven? I'm assuming. Yeah. Cannabis and hemp shows. Fantastic. So what, from your perspective, um, you know, what, where do you go more? Is it finance? Is it product driven? Uh, specifically to, to what you do? Because you and I spoke on uh, MJ Bulls, which is more financially driven, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's the show that we started. I, I started MJ Bulls, which is just about raising money or investing money. So we, we, I mean, and it's pretty easy to find guests because everybody's raising money and the people that aren't raising it are the investors. So that was how MJ Bulls started. And, you know, I've been, it's almost four years now. I think we're closing in on 400 episodes. And, you know, I, I, I think I'm booked all the way until July right now with, with interviews. Cause like I said, everybody's, everybody's raising money. So it's, you know, that's, that's, and it's fun because I get a chance to talk to a lot of really inspiring entrepreneurs that have some really, really good ideas. Just, they just need a little, you know, a little, little, little boost. They need somebody to give them that little extra, that little extra kick in the pants to get them over the hump. And, and, um, you know, hmm. Sometimes it works. Sometimes listen, being on our show is just all they needed to get that to get their financing. Where are some of the advertisers that you're seeing? Are they all cannabis companies, or or are you also targeting mainstream companies that want to go after cannabis consumers? Right. I'm hearing a little bit of both in in, in general in the industry. Yeah, mostly our focus is is just on the cannabis industry right now. I, I suspect at some time at some point down the road. Domino's or Doritos or Uber or somebody like that will call us, but we have enough business right now within the cannabis industry. I mean, as you know, nobody can advertise. You can't get on Google ads. You can't get on Facebook. You can't get on, there's no place to advertise. So cannabis or podcasts are one place where people can say what they want. No censorship. We can put the ads out. So I think that's one of the attractions, you know, there's no other options and they can say whatever they want. Does that drive a premium in pricing when it comes to to the fact that there are no other options? Do you, I mean, if you compare, you know, what uh, cannabis companies are paying to to be on on PodConnex programs versus a mainstream advertiser, do you do you see a higher rate just because there there's like limited supply for for you know the content side of things? Well, it's not it's not like we hold them over a barrel. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> But yeah, I would say that we, we can charge our CPMs are much higher than the industry standard or the industry average. But a part of that is because we have, they're all, they're all niche, niche podcasts and the, and the listeners are very loyal to the host. So if the host does a host read, it's a real, it, it may not be an ex exact endorsement, but I think that that drives a lot more sales because it's as opposed to just a generic ad go to zip.com and listen to, you know, you listen to this Joe Rogan show and you hear about a zip.com commercial. You're like, you know, does that drive me to buy it versus if you have one of the, you know, a host that you're intimate with and you hear every week, I think that's one of the reasons that we, that we can get a little higher CPM. CPM is cost per, per thousand. And for our list, you know, listeners that aren't familiar with it, we, that's, that's download. So we, we, um, we chart, we, the industry averages, I think it's $25 per thousand downloads. And, and we do quite a bit higher than that, but still, again, not that we're holding anybody over a barrel. It's just that I think it's, I think, I think we, ha we have a really, um, a unique product. And I think that's why we, we are able to achieve that higher CPM. You are such an interesting guest on multiple levels in the sense that marketing is such an issue uh, for, for cannabis brands and companies and you provide an outlet for it, but then you also, uh, have a perspective you know, by talking to these cannabis companies. Ideally, uh, you know, we can maybe say similar to us, but I'd love to hear from you. Is there a perspective or something that sticks out, you know, right now talking to companies uh, and we'll stick to the financial sense, maybe from MJ Bulls, if you don't mind, um, you know, that, that that really sticks out to you that you've heard a lot or or just is uh, is something that rings with you? Well, I think, unfortunately, it's the... the um cash is starting to dry up. I think a lot of the, a lot of the VC money is not, it's not available. Maybe it's not available at the, at the multiples or the, at the evaluation that the companies are used to, or, you know, maybe miss that boat. 
the really high valuations those days. I, yeah. I, unfortunately, I'm afraid they're gone. And, you know, but for the investor standpoint, I think it's they've come back down to earth. And actually, right now, I feel like, you know, they may even be lower and, and going lower. And that's and that's you know, it's too bad because a lot of these, you know, a lot of, a lot of people held off on raising money. They bootstrapped it. And then when they're right, finally, when they're ready and they have you know, something or that's about the same time that the that the prices go down and, and also it dries up. I mean, there's it's it's a tough it's tough to raise money right now. I feel for these for, for yeah. a lot of these companies. No, I agree. I agree. Well, have you seen any specific uh, reasons why investors are are bullish or why some investors are still bullish and in, in investing into specific businesses? Like, why are you hearing on that front? Like, what are the most investable businesses right now from your perspective? Well, they're all every investor that we talk to is always talking about brands, brand, 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 brand. So they're always talking about brand, but I almost to a point where I'm almost like, well, just you know, that's the talking points. And I'm not positive that that's exactly what, you know, that's the truth or if they're just, if that's what everybody's saying. So that's what they're saying. But I hear that almost everybody that we're talking to is we're looking for brands. We're looking for brands. Um, and also, and you know, unfortunately the, the um, limited license states, I mean, everybody's gaga about investing in, in a, in a, you know, somebody that has a license in a limited, limited license state. I understand why, but it's but but you're also missing out on a lot of really exciting ancillary ancillary businesses that you know are really I think they're they're going to change a, not just the cannabis industry but a, the the industries outside of the cannabis company because they get a chance to incubate their business without competitors coming in from all the other places. I mean, I'll use my daughter's company for an example. You know the big recruiting companies aren't touching cannabis right now. So she, so she had an, an opportunity to really explode her company without having, you know, indeed staring, staring over, you know, knocking her down every time she's, so that's, and I see that with a lot of the, the ancillary companies. And I'm unfortunately, um, I'm afraid that a lot of the investors, I, I just don't know if they're as sexy. And I think that's why a lot of them, you know, a lot of them are, you know, they, they don't have the good story that they can share with their LPs about an ancillary company. But, you know, you tell somebody about a limited license. Or a, yeah. That's really more sexy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and kind of wrapping up here for me, I'd love to hear from you about the other parts of the industry that you, yeah, your network covers. Uh, you know, what else could we go to PodCon X and learn about in the cannabis space outside of finance? <laughs> it's, it's crazy how eclectic it is. It's crazy how eclectic it is. I mean, I'll I'll start right off by talking about the Deadhead Cannabis Show. I mean, it's a show that's similar to yours. It's a weekly show. They talk about the news, the news of the week, and then they roll right into the, the Grateful Dead. And there's a connection between cannabis and Grateful Dead, and you know the, the listeners just love it. They talk about concerts, and these guys. I mean, it's scary how much stuff they know about the Grateful Dead. I mean, <laughs> it, it's 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 almost yeah, unhealthy. No, it's almost Dead unhealthy. Are relentless. <laughs> it's unhealthy. I think sometimes I'm like, are you guys serious? They name dates, and they're like, oh yeah, that date we saw. This was it was a great uh, <laughs> Franklin Tower or some you know scar whatever. And I'm like, whoa, this is scary. Wow. So that. So that's, I mean, that's, it kind of gives you, give you a range. We just, we just uh, launched a new show called Terps in the City um, with uh, Cheryl Murray Powell, uh, whom you may have had on your show before. She's, she's um, just really done a great job, but she's, she's moving to New York City and she's do, basing the whole show on, you know, the New York, how everything's unfolding in New York. So it's, you know, kind of gives you a perspective on that. And then, you know, we have a couple of good hemp shows. We have Hemp Errands and Let's Talk Hemp, two run by two really, you know, like I would say found founding fathers in the hemp industry, yeah. Joy, Joy Beckerman and, and Morris Beagle. Morris has the um, NOCO and a few of those, you know, so he's, he, you know, that's where you'd know him from. And then, and then we have hemp, then we have pot moms, which is just a fun show where she tests out strains or um, the, the cannabis podcast, same thing. Gary's up in Canada and and he's just knocking it out of the park up in Canada. So it's just like I said, nice. like a really well-rounded group of people. And for me, it's great because they're all really cool. Like it's everybody's really nice. Everybody shares, and we we put we promote. They put their 
everyone puts their promo on everybody else's uh, show. Like we run it at the end and everybody's real fair, real, real cooperative about sharing information. There's no like proprietary uh, bent to anybody. It's every, it's everybody's really, really laid back about that. And uh, it's just, you know, it's fun. That's awesome. Awesome. Dan Humiston, founder and CEO of PodCon X. Check it out. I was on there. Uh, I mean, it's a really an incredible network you've built. Oh, yeah. uh, marketing tool for the cannabis industry and just uh, a source of information, y'all. You come to Benzinga for information. Uh, if there are other sources we can recommend, PodCon X is one of them. So thank you, Dan, so much for being on here, my friend. Oh, my pleasure. Speak to you soon. Yes, sir. Definitely looking forward to it. All right. Honestly, I really enjoy the information Dan puts oh, yeah. out, the content he puts out. It's a lot of fun. And I feel like mainstream media just misses that part of information so much as making it um, yeah. enjoyable to digest. Uh, so hopefully we do that to an extent. Um, but outside of that, Javier, <laughs> any, any other news items? Let's take two minutes before we run the interview with, with Abner. Anything you want to touch on quickly? Uh, I want to shout out Lord Byron and Nabel Matthew, who are super active in the chat today. I love the conversation. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to follow it. I will go back to the video and check it out. I, I, I see you're having some very interesting discussions um, around True Leave, around pricing. Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, I don't think I got much more on my end, really. There is a Senate candidate called John Fetterman who campaigned using T-shirts saying it's high time to legalize cannabis. Yeah, uh, he was just on the like news. A fun, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Fun I mean, item. it's nice to see other uh, mainstream politicians jump on the bandwagon positively because we still see those who are against it for whatever yep. reason. Headlines more than anything, I think. Yeah, um, then, I don't know, like Schwa's earnings, Tilt Holdings. Ooh, earnings. No, no. Here's Get one. Here's one. Let's take one minute to hear your thoughts on Pablo Zwanich's note on Columbia Care. Not positive, but it is tied to Cresco Labs. So any thoughts you want to pass on to our audience about those two tier one stocks? Let me bring it up. <laughs> um, not really. I, I, I don't have it like off the top of my mind. Uh, we do know that Pablo is pretty bullish on, on Columbia Care. Um, he is overweight on the stock. Price target of $5.10. Uh, but uh, having said this, he does um, highlight the 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 importance of the Cresco deal and in, in the future of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, Bazinga.com slash cannabis for any more details. What what did you have in mind? What were you uh what, what what caught your eye? Is it like the jersey thesis or yeah I mean for me I'll be honest Columbia Care has always been one of my favorites in this industry. I'm a big Nick Vita fan. I'm a big fan of how they get the data and survey it before their customers buy and they create a unique experience. I think it drives basket sizes. It drives um, retention and customer loyalty. And, and I always love that aspect uh, of data-led sales uh, for Columbia Care. Um, I would wasn't thrilled that <laughs> they were being acquired, uh, to be quite frank with you. So I just think it's interesting to keep up with them. Obviously, we we do want these these M&A transactions to, to be somewhat of a fuel to this industry. So I'm not oh, voting yeah. against it or anything like that. Um, but I'm a big fan of I'm Columbia not Care. not terrible if you're a Columbia Care shareholder either. So Exactly. Uh, I don't think there's, there's a lot of negatives to it per se. I just love Columbia Care. Um, that being said, let's get to the interview. Javier, always a pleasure, my brother, uh, in a different country. Uh, yes. But we get to do this twice a week. Everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Tune into this earnings video. We hear some MedMen chatter. We hear some lawsuit against the federal Ooh. government chatter. Uh, we, we got some We got some really good stuff at Abner Curtin, CEO of Ascend Wellness me. Holdings. A-A-W-H <laughs> on the OTC. Aaron, let's run it. Hello, my friends. We have another special episode. It's what we do. We got Abner Curtin, CEO of Ascend Wellness. They are OTC listed AWHH, a major multi-state operator. Aaron, let's bring him on over. We're going to dive into their earnings report and everything else that's happening in your life. I don't know how you have time to breathe, my friend. How are you? 
I'm good. Thanks, Elliot. I don't know about everything in my life, but I'm happy to discuss. <laughs> I'm happy to discuss. Uh, I just want to know, you know, what's in your bar behind you? What you had for breakfast? I mean, we'll go into it all here, but let's start with how you feel your Q1 earnings and your Q1 report performance. Uh, how'd it go for you? I, th- I think pretty good. You know, I think uh, my CFO, Dan, who's trying to the valley for the year. We, we had stable operating performance. Uh, sales were flat. EBITDA dipped a, a touch based on, um, you know, the buildup uh, ahead of New Jersey. Um, and we're excited for the rest of the year. You know, we say this industry is about stair-step growth. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've been, we, we, we've been kind of flat for the last couple of quarters. And now, you know, New Jersey's been a huge hit. And we expect to ride that uh, growth for the rest of the year. Um, and that's, you know, that's the way we roll. We bring on assets. We um, and we scale up this business, and it's very stair steppy. And I know investors, I think throughout the industry, have been a little frustrated by the flat industry performance of the next couple quarters. But we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, New Jersey's fabulous, and we've got a number of other opportunities behind that. Um, I, I also would say that um, you know, for us, we are probably the uh, smallest company. Uh, relative to the, well, not the smallest, but smaller than the big MSOs with New Jersey exposure. So, for instance, if we can do 100 million or so out of our three stores, you know, that's off a $330 million base uh, for 2021. And while Pure Leaf and GTI are going to have great businesses off of New Jersey, it's just it's just off a much larger base. So we think, you know, so we've got a lot of leverage uh, to that growth growth in New Jersey. That's exciting. So uh, we we have a lot of cannabis investors that tune in, but we also have a lot of sector agnostic investors tune in. So you had a a bit of an operational approach, it seems, to Q1, getting New Jersey online, having some canopies come online as well. Um, Could you just give us a quick overview of the other markets that you're in as well? Well, I I would, I think cannabis, I think non-cannabis investors or even really diehard cannabis investors are agnostic at this point. Touche. Touche. At some point after you get beat over the head day after day, you become agnostic to everything. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, look, we, 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 we have a little bit of a different approach. We are, you know, we're in seven states, all of which are kind of the Northeast through the Midwest. And so, you know, from West to East, I think if I do it correctly, is... Um, uh, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. I think that, I don't know, it's, it's close. And we really go, you know, we, we call ourselves MSO 2.0. You know, we, we were founded in 18, um, and we have an investment background, and we bought existing licenses in uh, late stage medical and uh, to basically build those assets out and uh, and turn them on for rep. Mm-hmm. You know, we think this is a very similar strategy to what legendary investors like John Malone and Tank Turner did in, in cable and uh, cellular, where there's original license winners uh, and they, they did a good job. But the next stage of consolidation and scaling uh, just requires a different skill set. And so somebody like us can consolidate those assets. And so we think we have the best assets in the industry because we pick them. You know, we, we, we like the limited license states. We like that Northeast uh, to Midwest corridor. Uh, we're focused on being a top five player in each of our states. And we think that kind of focused uh, portfolio is going to make a lot of sense going forward. Also, when you look at our portfolio, you've got uh, Illinois has been our biggest profit dr- uh, driver. Uh, Illinois is, you know, we did 100 million of EBITDA last year in Illinois and 80 million overall. So we incorporated and every other state was in the investing mode, uh, kind of on that J curve. And now we're in a period where we're bringing those assets, you know, up the J curve. New Jersey goes from, you know, flat profitability to massive profitability mm-hmm. overnight. Um, and we and we're going to roll that forward in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New York over the next few years. So we're one of the few MSOs that show accelerating growth between 22 and 23. Um, obviously, we have to do it, but like you know, so so while other companies are kind of getting into that mature kind of cash flow generation, we're still at, we're still in high growth mode here in the seven. 
This has this is a, a side note uh, from your Q1 earnings here, as this is not really pertaining to it. But it, it, when when speaking of an M and A strategy, I feel like you all have been pretty targeted uh, across your life cycle, pretty strategic about it. Is that is that accurate? And would you expect 2022 to be more organic or inorganic growth? If you can, you know, say much. Yeah, more. yeah, sure. No, we we say we, we want to stay within our core um, area. So that's the Northeast and the Midwest contiguous states primarily and limited license you know we just in the last couple of months really added pennsylvania and new york two of the largest states in our region the two largest we're not involved in um you know 33 plus million people combined uh both of those assets are paper assets with some limited um assets so we have our work cut out for us to turn those assets on so I don't look to be doing any large acquisitions, um, uh, but you know, I say that, no. I mean, you have to be opportunistic in a consolidating industry, so who knows, but um, you know, what we really want to do is fill in acquisitions. And when you look at it, Ohio is the state where we have some presence. We really want to get up to the cap. We really like Ohio. Um, we have eight stores in Illinois. We can go up to 10 by the cap. Um, you know, Michigan is a state that we've, we've uh, been reticent about, but um, now with our grow online, we're looking to do selective retail uh, acquisitions to get a little bit more vertical. Um, you know, nice. uh, contiguous states that we're not in Connecticut, Maryland, Missouri, you know, we'll, we'll look at them. But like I said, I mean, we really have our hands full with Pennsylvania and New York, and, and we really need you to focus on execution. Yeah, that's, that's a great note. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's move to uh, maybe some more recent developments as well. Can you, it seems like a positive development in the um, Ascend Wellness MedMen saga. Is there anything you'd like to, to note on that uh, as we kind of put that in our rear view? Yeah, dead man is dead. Uh, we, 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 you know, we, Darth Vader is the people here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're ready to move forward. So, I mean, this is, you know, um, all of us have sold things in our lives that at some point we realized we didn't want to sell or we sold at too cheap a price. Mm -hmm. But most of us realize that we're governed by laws and morality and we have to, we have to go through with those deals regardless. Um, and that's life. Well, you know, unfortunately in this case, we ran into a, an unsavory group that, that, that really wanted to renegotiate the deal. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, the American legal system is, is time consuming and we really needed to move forward in New York. So, you know, we paid them uh, an additional fee of $15 million, uh, but our total purchase price for the deal is $88 million. Only 74 of that gets paid now. And when you compare that, you know, Scott's Miracle Grow just paid $247 million for the NTN, uh, the Rano transaction and others. You know, we, we feel it's a really attractive price. New York's a really attractive state. Uh, so we're ready to move forward here. Absolutely. That's great. Great note there. All right. Last but not least, uh, we had a bit of breaking news yesterday, we'll say, with a lawsuit. I'm going to let you just tell us all about that. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we at um, Ascend and talking to our friends and other MSOs are looking uh, to file a suit over the next two or three months uh, against the federal government uh, and the Department of Justice. And on the basis that the Controlled Substance Act uh, is unconstitutionally applied to the state legal uh, cannabis industries. And just to be clear, there have been some constitutional challenges, uh, Charlotte's Web and others asking to deschedule marijuana from the Controlled Substance Act because marijuana is a great plant and blah, 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 which it is. But those constitutional challenges will all fail and have failed uh, because the federal government can schedule and deschedule whatever they want. Mm -hmm. What they can't do is regulate intrastate commerce. And these are state legal businesses. And if the government wants to prevent uh, interstate commerce of cannabis, uh, according to the Controlled Substance Act, they can do so. But what they can't do is regulate interest rate business. And 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 there, there's tremendous precedent lately. The DraftKings, uh, basically went after the same issue, saying that the federal government couldn't regulate state sports gambling businesses. Uh, back in 2012, Obamacare was struck down on this issue. Obamacare uh, was uh, uh, 
allowed to go forward because of taxation. But the, the, they said, look, these are 50 state health insurance businesses. This is not the government's purview. Um, and we, we, we think the same for, uh, for state legal cannabis businesses. And if successful, it's very similar to like what the state's uh, rights act uh, by Nancy Mace in the, in the House is, is proposing, but we're, we're just going at it through the judiciary. Um, and and, and um, it's a, you know, we, we have a very favorable court uh, for the 10th Amendment and states' rights. I mean, unfortunately, we saw that recently with Roe v. Wade, but, but, um, but you have a, you have a uh, court that uh, time and time again is focused on the 10th Amendment and the rights of states as independent entities to control their, their views. So if successful, 280E goes away, uh, we, we, can, um, we get federal bank accounts and we go to the exchanges right away. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, lawsuit. And we're hoping that state attorney generals will join us. Uh, you saw that Colorado and Arizona uh, AGs made public statements. A number of others have gotten involved. And we think, you know, state attorney generals who, who, who are really on the side of this want to uh, want to get it done. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, 280 and exchanges help the MSOs uh, and some others. But, you know, the, the right to federal bank accounts is, and, and credit cards is killing everybody. And, and it's a safety issue, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we can argue about the unfairness from a business point of view all day long, but, you know, we, we have a safety issue with all this cash in these uh, stores. And I, you know, I can get a bank account as an MSO, but, you know, these, these mom and pops and social equity guys are really struggling. You know, I can spend a ton of money on security and I'm still at risk and my employees are at risk, but for the smaller players in this industry, it's terrible. And there is no purview in any business for, um, the federal government to impose on state legal businesses. Now, the reason this exists was back in 2006, there was a case of, uh, with the Supreme Court called Wright v. Gonzalez. And in that case, um, uh, the California uh, cannabis, uh, was a home grower at the time, wanted to be legal. And they were like, no, because the federal government using the Commerce Clause uh, it, uh, can, can regulate this. And the Commerce Clause basically says, look, um, you know, I, I, I can't let Iowa wheat be separate because that's going to set the price. There's one wheat price around the United States. So, so, so even though you grow it in Iowa, it's really under the federal guidelines. But that clearly doesn't apply to Kansas. These are 50 right. or 39 state separate businesses. These states have uh, put in place uh, seed to sale tracking uh, uh, measures against diversion uh, as well. So, and in 2006, none of that existed. So it's a different world. Secondly, um, uh, and, and uh, Justice Thomas just wrote on this last year the, that in the 16 years subsequent to Wright, the federal government hasn't done anything. They haven't gone after state legal businesses. They haven't really enforced interstate commerce very effectively. So, and, you know, the government can't selectively uh, enforce laws. You know, they, they can't be arbitrary. Well said. Yeah. So, um, you know, the fact that they haven't done anything for 16 years, uh, they've really lost standing to uh, uh, on the state business. And thirdly, it's a different court. I mean, in 2006, it was a 6-3 decision. The dissenting voices were Thomas, Rehnquist, and O'Connor. Um, obviously, we have a 6-3 majority now in the conservative justices. And, and, in, and, and it fell in 6-3 to states' rights. And you know, you, you had very conservative justices who probably have no interest in cannabis. And, and, and this lawsuit, um, and which is why it's a really a bipartisan and we'll get a lot of Republican support, that, you know, you can substitute cannabis with anything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and Justice Thomas said that. He said, what are we going to do, regulate quilting next? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> that's what he said in his 2006 decision. Like, you know, so it, it's about the federal government getting out of a state legal business, you know, full stop. Cool. I love it. And it would affect the ruling that happened, what was it, yesterday in Pennsylvania about medical cannabis being a controlled substance. So that yeah. is, uh, I mean, I look forward to seeing more on that. And Namner, props to you and the other MSOs for taking the lead on that, as I'm sure a lot of people on the non-quote-unquote corporate side uh, would, would want to see that from the corporate side, for lack of a better term. I, I mean, look, this industry, you know, we're all, we're all we're all looking uh, we're all scaling a business and it's really hard right every day is hard um you know just 
a couple of days ago, we lost the corporate benefits program because that that program is being bought by J.P. Morgan and J.P. Morgan mm-hmm. Bank, Bank. So you know, so I've got a finance department that's trying to consolidate acquisitions, scale a business, and they've got to run around and get a new vendor for some for some financing, and and, and that goes on all over the industry. Uh, at the same time, you know, it's it's a new business. There aren't really uh, SOPs around growing and everything else. We're all kind of you know, building the plane as we uh, as we fly it here, and um, but 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 the industry needs to do more. Um, obviously, social equity um, and working with social equity players is certainly an area we need to do more. Um, you know, working with groups like Last Prisoner Project, which we're involved in, to to get some people who are unfairly still in prison uh, for cannabis uh, distribution out of jail. And we need to help change this. I mean, you know, we, I think we're figuring out that the Senate is just completely asleep at the switch. Uh, you know, Schumer, Schumer, Booker, and Wyman, you know, it's, they remind me of toddlers, right? Toddlers, you know, if they, if they don't get their way, they're just going to scream and yell and hide in their room, right? And that's what the Democrats seem willing to do. They will accept nothing over something. Um, and that's that's terrible. And, and uh so, you know, hopefully by going through the judicial branch, hopefully we can change the conversation. I'm talking to other CEOs of cannabis companies. I hope they join us. We're going to talk to state AGs. Um, and we're going to try, because I think besides just the legal aspect, hopefully this will move the conversation. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, and, and move the conversation in a way that the Congress realizes that they really need to do something. Yeah. Well, Abner, appreciate it. You know, we're a little over time, but I think awesome, awesome update. Appreciate that from you. Congrats on getting started in New Jersey. Uh, I think Q2 is going to be exciting to watch in the rest of the year, of course. Any last thoughts you want to pass to the audience uh, as, as we wait to hear from you for another three months, my friend? Yeah, well, you know, like I like to say these days, because, you know, I was a value investor for a long time. I, you know, I, I have scars on my back. This is, a, <laughs> this, this is a tough period. I mean, there are no buyers for the space, uh, completely divorced from fundamentals. But, you know, think when I just think about Ascend is, you know, I'm on a path to generate $200 million of EBITDA. And I've got a market cap, I think, around 550, 575. And so I don't know what the stock's going to do tomorrow. I don't even know what the stock's going to do in six months or 12 months. But I do know... If I generate the two hundred million dollars of EBITDA, my stock is worth a lot more than five fifty. So that yeah. that's what I have to do as the CEO. And I think as investors, you know, we kind of need to, you know, take a deep breath, do yoga, whatever. But but I, I think the thesis the thesis is that. Yeah, absolutely. Abner Curtin, CEO of Sin Wellness, ticker AWHH on the OTC for all you U.S. based investors out there. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. A-A-A-A-W-H. A A W H A A W H. You know what? I'm going to take the blame for that one. I'm pretty sure I got my double letter mixed up on that. A A W H. This is why I say these things so I can be corrected. Abner, thank you so much for joining us. If you never see the wrong ticker on Benzinga again, (laughs) we'll see you soon, my friend.